Hello, everyone. I'm Taryn Almanzar. I'm the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid here at Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism. I know that you're literally from all over the world, which, by the way, is very reflective of what you will find in Pulitzer Hall. I like to call it, it's very New York, very global, very eclectic, very diverse. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever it is that you may be joining us. It's so great to see so many faces and names. And I just have to say, I love this process because right now you're figuring out if this is the right path for you, if this is the J school where you want to go. And before you know it, you're applying, you're a student and you're graduating. I know I've graduated all of you. Um, so all of that to say, I'm excited to see each and every single one of you. Um, I also want to say thank you for submitting your very thoughtful questions as you were signing up for this webinar, um, because that allowed us to plan for this session and to have the right questions for our panelists. Before we get started, just a very kind reminder that this webinar is not going to delve into our academic programs, admissions process, or the different educational financing options. I promise you we have quite a few webinars in the upcoming weeks that will be targeting those different areas. So make sure to sign up for it. As a matter of fact, on Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York City time, we will have a webinar where we're going to go into details about the admissions application process, the materials, what we're looking for, what's a great application, what you should be thinking about. So if you can join us for that webinar, please do so. If you have any follow-up questions after that, or if you want to reach out to us, please do so. There's nothing like asking questions. It saves you a lot of guessing work. And there's so many ways that you can connect with our office. We have chats where you literally go in and put in your questions and we can answer that right away. We have virtual open hours where you drop in, no need to set up the appointments and one of us will be there to answer your questions. Every Friday, we have information sessions, which is more of a group setting. And you can ask your questions, we'll go over the academic programs, so on and so forth. All of that to say is that our virtual doors are open. So reach out to us, reach out, reach out, reach out. With that said, I will now like to turn this over to our panelists, which I am very excited to have today with us. Um, we have Jelani Cobb, who is our newly appointed Dean of the Journalism School. And we have Asma Khan, who is the director of the June and Simon Lee Global Center for Journalism. Both are faculty members, both are well, world renowned journalists. Um, why don't we start with career trajectory and what led both of you to Pulitzer Hall? Jelani, if we mm -hmm. can start with you. So uh, first, I'd like to uh, echo your welcome and say that we're excited to have all of you uh, here uh, to participate. Uh, and I think you'll find that uh, Taryn and you know the team at admissions uh, are equipped to answer any and every question. Uh, more than likely, uh, whatever question you have is one that we've encountered before. Uh, and you know we're eager to make sure that you have the information uh, that you need to make the best decision for you. Uh, we're slightly biased when we think about what that best decision looks like. Uh, so in terms of career trajectory, uh, I used to think that I had an unusual background um, for journalism, and then I realized that there really is no set background, you know, for journalism. And one of the things that I like uh, the most about this field is that literally anything that you've done <laughs> in your life, anything that you know about in some way, shape or form uh, equips you or gives you an insight uh, into something else that's happening in the world or helps you cover uh, some subject uh, that will be important you know, to readers or to listeners or to viewers. For me, uh, you know, I kind of did some things do what you, I think you would think were typical. I uh, wrote for my college paper, uh, we didn't have a paper in my high school, but, you know, I was kind of always you know, like among, you know, the crowd of kids that were interested in media and things like that. Uh, I majored in English and history in undergrad. 
Uh, and then after undergrad, I started working at the Washington City Paper, which was, uh, I mean, it still exists, it, an alternative paper in Washington, D.C. And, you know, the Alternative Weekly, um, at that, especially at that point, the Alternative Weekly uh, industry uh, was really a big training ground uh, for people who went, you know, to magazines, went to bigger newspapers, and so on. And so that was the the place where I learned the basics. I learned the metabolism of the news cycle. Of, you know, when you pitch stories, you know, when you go out and work on a story, how long it takes to edit a story, uh, and then you know the feedback that everyone gives, you know, in the meeting after you know that week's issue comes out. Uh, and in some ways, everything that I've done since then, you know, including, you know, working at The New Yorker has just been a bigger scaled version of what I learned there. Uh, a little bit unusual in that I also went to graduate school and got a, a master's and PhD in American history. Uh, but to my earlier point, you know, that became very useful uh, even, you know, in the journalism that I've done. And so the work that I do now has tended to be... Um, very much informed by history, a, a kind of historically informed work. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about that is that, you know, I've written for more of my career as a freelance person uh, than I did as a staff writer. And so I'm kind of very much attuned to the complexities and difficulties of what it takes to uh, navigate a career as a freelance person. And it was like comparatively, after a comparatively long period of time, uh, that David Remnick at The New Yorker uh, came across some of my work and was interested in me uh, becoming part of The New Yorker uh, community there. And so that's been that. And uh, specifically Pulitzer Hall, um, the way I got here was uh, on the one train. Uh, and so <laughs> uh, took the one up from 59th, uh, got off at 116th, make a right, can't miss it. <laughs> Thank you, Jelani. I love listening to you and I feel so lucky to be here, um, not just with all of you now, but in thinking about this question, like the path to Pulitzer Hall, like I walk in every day just genuinely in awe and feeling lucky. And so I'm excited that you're all here. And I'd love to tell you about my path to journalism. I, I grew up, I was born and raised in Michigan. And I, you know, studied political science and women's studies, and I went to graduate school right out of Michigan, and I was focused on gender studies. Um, and I spent a lot of time working on this big thesis for that master's degree, looking at gender and development and aid. Um, and like, I spent so much time on my thesis, and I was writing it one night, or I was like putting it together, and it hit me that at a maximum, probably five people would read this, like whatever my thesis committee would be, that's what this piece of work that I'd sunk all of this time and effort into would reach so few people. And in part, that's that can be the nature of academia. That can also be, you know, how accessible you are as a writer. It can be reach. It can be all of these things. And I just thought, I would love to be able to focus on injustice, look at these, you know, intersecting forms of oppression or different kinds of challenges that communities face and to write about them in a way that is accessible, that is meaningful to people, that makes me feel like I'm not working in isolation. And so I wasn't really sure where to start. I had no journalism background, but I thought, why don't I start in my hometown? And so I moved back to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I briefly worked in this kind of non it wasn't an internship because I was no longer a student, but I worked at the local NBC affiliate um, in Grand Rapids for about the two months, which was, this was 2008, so it was during the election, and I think until September, uh, the presidential election, I think until September, Michigan had been a battleground state, so there were political visits and things like that that I, you know, made these reels of that were not great, but I was able to use like some of those clips and things that I'd done and I moved to Pakistan, which is, um, you know, where my family is originally from, um, but I'd never worked in the media industry there, but I just basically said to Pakistani television channels, like, I can help you produce coverage of the 2008 election, you know, and, and it just really stemmed from there. I really fell in love with journalism. And for any of you who are interested in international reporting, 
you know, I would really recommend spending time, whether it's a summer or something else at a local outlet in another country. I assume, I know many of the students who come in have done that, um, but it's just such an incredible way to look at the world is not to be, you know, covering it from the lens of, you know, Western news organizations that may look at some of these countries in different ways um, than people in these countries do, right? You get a really incredible lens. And I think that's something that Columbia does so well. It's part of the ultimate path that brought me to, to Pulitzer Hall is this understanding of global journalism is always local, right? In so many mm -hmm. ways, the best journalism is about getting local. And I fell in love. I fell in love with getting local on the ground. I wound up doing that in Pakistan, um, doing that in Michigan and um, Detroit for some stories that I've worked on in the past. And I think it's part of what's like kept me and just to kind of echo Jelani, like has kept me so into journalism is that it brings together so many fields. It brings together history. It brings together deep research. You can do really interesting things with data. You can spend mm -hmm. time with people. And then the skills, the storytelling skills, the communication skills, all of that is so relevant to other parts of your life. And so, yeah, I stuck with it. I specifically got very, very obsessed with investigative journalism and we can talk more about that. But I think of this as a path that, you know, combines, you know, now being at Columbia, combines teaching, combines learning, combines, you know, I'm continuously learning. It kind of combines all of these passions in one place. So how could you not? Mm -hmm. uh, those were amazing um, career trajectories. And as I listen to both of you, what if I may find a common denominator there is that you both did not go to complete your undergraduate degree in journalism, mm -hmm. or your career trajectory did not start there, which is very similar to what we see in most of our students and in most of our applicants and what we see in today's world where um, people have a genuine interest to really inform the public either about a current event that is happening where they take out their cameras, their phones and they start recording it or they start writing about it and expressing what is going on in their environment. So let's take a little step back and can we define what is journalism? What is well-reported, grounded, ethical journalism? And why it's so important to have to do that kind of reporting in today's world? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I will give you a very basic working definition um, of journalism, uh, which is the meticulous, careful, disinterested gathering of information for the purpose of educating the public. You're doing those things. I think that's a fair working definition um, of journalism. There are a whole array of, of ethical concerns around that. But I think that the reasons why journalism is important, it used to be that we had to kind of explain those things more than we do now. Uh, I think that we see a world now that is awash in false information. And you know what journalism is supposed to do is provide people with the information they need to make decisions about their life. You know, whether that is, you know, it's going to rain today, so I need an umbrella or an overcoat, uh, or that the person who I voted for is uh, guilty of corruption and has been, you know, taking money under the table. Uh, we are supposed to help you navigate your life based upon the information that we can provide to you. And we've seen now we're in, you know, just the recent history of the pandemic uh, and, you know, the confusion around vaccines and around what kinds of medical treatments, you know, were helpful to people. Uh, confusion uh, around, you know, all sorts of kind of vital things that relate to people's lives. Uh, and we could spend the rest of this time going through examples of that if we wanted to. So the reasons why uh, have never been more more apparent, uh, but we have to protect, cultivate, uh, and create outlets for people to gain information and we all that they need. And we also have to, as we do here, train 
the best practitioners in the world so that they can actually supply or meet that need for people. I love that. And I love that kind of framing of this idea that journalism is changing in the time that it takes place, that its purposes can be multifaceted. And so I also, I would um, resist one explicit, you know, form of describing this um, permanently, but I do think that for me, it's about, at its heart, it's about informing the public. And that informing can be digging deep and exposing new things. It can be explaining it, it can be putting it in context, local mm -hmm. historical context. But this idea that the public needs access to basic information and sometimes complex information, and they need it in a way that they understand that's meaningful to them. Obviously, there are you know, researchers who do incredible studies. There are people who do very specialized um, localized kinds of work, but I think of journalism as this means to make things accessible to the public. I think of it as broad facing, as something that everyone can consume uh, or should be able to consume and serves that really, that purpose that's essential to a public that can talk to one another, to like the social fabric of any place that you're in. That's, um, I'm not a journalist. But I, I think that's what's kept me for so long here in Pulitzer Hall on a personal level because of the differences that I see, the type of reporting that our students, that our faculty members, and the impact that it has on, on a local level, national, and global. Um, I'm actually a lot older than I look, so I won't share how long I've been at the J School. But um, with that said, let's give examples um, of what it means. Jelani, I know that you have worked on a couple of documentaries and mm -hmm. you've written about uh, issues such as voting rights and police accountability. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your recent um, journalism and some of the core questions that, uh, that you were trying to answer? And address? Sure. Um, can I tell you one quick story? I, any, anyone who knows me knows that I'm like always detouring off into anecdotes. Um, but I have, I have one story that kind of illustrates what I love about journalism and how broad the parameters of work can be. Uh, during you know the the Great Recession in the United States, which was you know 2008 to 2012 or so 2011. Uh, I was I was sitting in a restaurant in Atlanta, and a reporter walked in, and his name's David Green. Uh, he had started out in New York and driven all the way down the East Coast of the United States, uh, just stopping in places and talking to people about how they were experiencing the recession. And he stopped into this restaurant uh, that I was in and wanted to know, you know, what I thought about, you know, what was happening in my local community, what was happening in the environment around me and so on. Uh, and, you know, I was eager to talk to him. And so, you know, I told him, you know, what I knew. As it just so happened, uh, three days later, I was leaving to go do a fellowship in Moscow at Moscow University. And I was going to be there for a whole semester. Uh, and so I go, I leave, uh, and a friend who was a journalist, says, uh, well, I know a reporter in Moscow who is having a get together. She can introduce you to some people and tell you about how to get around uh, in Moscow. And so I didn't even go to my apartment. I landed and went straight to this get this, this gathering, uh, which was in a place in Moscow I'd never been to before, didn't know anything about. And I walked in and the first person I saw sitting on the couch was David Green. And he was there to work on a story about African migrants in Moscow. And it had been that he just had these curiosities. He wanted to know how people were navigating the recession in the United States. And so he drove around the United States and, and did these interviews. Then he wanted to know about uh, and for report about what was happening with migrant communities in, in Russia. Uh, and he went to Russia and you know, did these stories there. Uh, and so, it really doesn't get better than that in terms of being able to pursue uh, interests that will not only inform the public, but as uh, Asmat said, educate you. <laughs> you know, you get to learn all kinds of things in this this profession. Um, to the the question about what we 
were trying to do with the, the projects we worked on, the documentaries about voting and about police accountability. You know, in each case, we started with, you know, one question and built the entire film around pursuing the answer to that question. Um, with the police accountability film, uh, it was, can policing be done differently? You know, we had seen many high profile instances of police brutality uh, and, you know, police were very defensive in saying that they had to do the things that they had to do. And very many people who were in communities were saying they didn't agree with that. And so we were curious about places that were trying to do policing differently. And we settled on Newark, New Jersey, and we spent a year there, you know, following police, following undercover units, talking to community members, and really getting a sense of how policing operated and how it was attempting to change there. Um, with the voting film, we started with a question, uh, which was, will voter access or impediments to voting impact who wins the 2020 election? And we thought that was a really important question. Uh, and so in 2018, we started looking at the landscape of voter access, what kinds of policies people had, uh, what kind of difficulties people were experiencing, you know, what this might translate into and whether or not it would have an impact on who wound up in the White House in the, in the following presidential election. So really, um, they, these are well-reported stories that impact the daily lives of people and have a lasting effect on our democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and on civil rights. So that was in the US, Asma. I'm going to turn to you now um, because your work involves the United States, but also it is their impact abroad and what they were, um, certain actions that were taken from you recently were recognized with a Pulitzer Prize for that investigation uh, into the US strikes that killed many civilians. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to pursue that story and what kind of investigative work went into it because you were doing it in both places? Right, um, thank you for that question. Um, I just to take you back to when this began, um, it was 2016 explicitly. It's true that I had, you know, reported on the drone program, had reported on American wars in the past, but this specific project came out of watching the anti ISIS air war and seeing in the front pages of even a newspaper that I now write for this, these statistics that physically were impossible, right? The United States has killed 25,000 ISIS fighters in Iraq and Syria, meaning the entire population of ISIS would have been eradicated and reproduced, right? Because the numbers, the estimates were staying constant. Um, and at the same time, seeing the US military claim that they had only killed 21 civilians. And if you know, if you look back at the history of wars, that is next to impossible. And yet it was largely going unchallenged. Like this was part of you know, what I suspected to be a myth that was going unchallenged. And, you know, what I thought was, well, you know, I recently finished a ground investigation in Afghanistan where I did a sample of US funded schools um, in seven battlefield provinces in that country to understand, you know, do American claims about having made all of this educational progress in Afghanistan to the extent that they claim, do they add up? You know, I've done that there. I wonder if I could actually understand if these claims that are coming out that are going largely unchallenged, if they really stack up, like, are we killing so few civilians? You know, if we are, that is really important to verify and understand why. But if we aren't, it's even more important to verify and understand why. And so I thought, can I do a sample? You know, can I get on the ground pockets of territory in 2016 really started to be retaken from ISIS. And I thought, can I get into a town and can I sample a single town? Can I tell the story of one town? And I 
you know, just hit the ground, right? I, I mean, it requires some preparation. I teach a conflict reporting class that really like takes you through all the steps of what you need to do and, you know, how you need to know about a place before you go there, how you get local. Um, but, but that's what I did. And I, you know, the first time that I was really able to sample a town um, called Kayara, I went to the sites of 10 airstrikes in that town and five of them had resulted in civilian deaths. And that was a rate that was much, much higher, um, dozens of times higher, um, that particular rate than what the US military was claiming. And so I knew this was important. And you know, I wound up, it's a longer story um, that we can talk more about later, but I wound up dedicating what became years of my life to, to really investigating that because it felt so important to understand. Like rarely, if you look back at history, if you look at wars in recent history, um, we might know some of what's happening in real time. We will get exposés about specific incidents, but oftentimes it's years later that you see those big numbers contested where you understand what the true scale of civilian death in Vietnam really was, or that you understand or what air power actually did. Like there's studies that have come out in recent years about Vietnam and air power that I've been so fascinated by, but it felt like if I could keep pursuing that on a systematic level, if I could put this in context, we would know about a war in real, like the true human costs, not just in numbers, but why it's happening. And like to interrogate the kind of fundamentals behind it, we would actually be informed or more informed about a war that's taking place, at least for Americans in our name. So it involved getting local, it involved getting really close to different people in Mosul and in different parts of Syria and Tokar, so in these different places to try to tell this story. Um, you know, it also involved years of Freedom of Information Act requests with the US military, a years long lawsuit that resulted in thousands of pages of records in assembling those records and studying them, you know, building sort of uh, an understanding of this that just kind of grew. And I think if you told me in the beginning, like, oh, you're going to spend the next six years of your life working on this, I would have been like, mm, no, I won't. No, thanks. But um, once you start to kind of build and you acquire these understandings of things, it just your wealth of knowledge breeds more reporting. And it's really hard to walk away from. And I just feel lucky that I was able to do it. quite an impactful story as lots of course I've you know read it and of course I've I've listened to to you discuss it but the way that you have really distilled the process of how you came about and how what drew you to it um it's 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 impactful I will say as I listen to you and I listen to Jelani what I've noticed about those both ex uh, both examples of, of this impactful work is that you both took issues that are just the magnitude of it, right? Mm -hmm. That it's across the board. It can be overwhelming because you're talking about civil rights in the United States. You're talking about airstrikes in a particular country. So what I've noticed about both of your process is that you looked at history. Mm -hmm. So what is the context of it? You were analytic in terms of what are the statistics, what is being exposed out there. And then you said, okay, I can't do this across the board. Let me zero in on a community. Jelani, with one of yours, you said, I'm going to focus the new work and see what's yeah. happening mm -hmm. there as an example of what's going on across the United States with asthma, I'm going to focus in five different areas and see how that is a, it's, it's, it's a reflection of everything else that's going on. You were both able to do that because of your experience and background in journalism. But as we know, given the fast pace of newsroom, um, the limited resources that they may have. What do you see the role then of journalism schools? How do they fit into equipping journalists either to give them more tools to do what you both have been able to do 
or to give them context mm -hmm. and to give them the history. What is the role of, of J schools I and mean, particularly think, Columbia? Mm -hmm. I think it's all of the above. When this school was founded in 1912 uh, at the, the direction of Joseph Pulitzer, uh, he envisioned journalism schools helping to uh, increase and maintain the level of professionalism uh, within uh, the field of journalism. Currently, if we're thinking about the learning curve of operating as a journalist, uh, what journalism school does is shorten that curve. That you know, skills and information and things that, you know, might have taken you five years or six years or seven years to pick up, you can, through the intensity of the experience here, uh, gain insight to and gain uh, those talents and those abilities in the course of a year. Uh, and, you know, if you're thinking about the diversity of things that you need to know, you know, if you need to know about media law, uh, that's difficult to come by, you know, just kind of out in the wild, so to speak. Uh, if you are interested in data journalism, that's going to be pretty difficult to come up. And, you know, we have a uh, excellent data journalism program here. Uh, the access to uh, this amazing library and the amazing holdings at Columbia University. Uh, and then the other thing, which is, you know, the, the secret weapon, which is the astonishingly broad and astonishingly accomplished alumni network that we have here. Uh, and so it's that community that really is, you know, so vital uh, and, you know, so key. And, you know, from the minute you uh, graduate, uh, there's this resource that you can call upon uh, if you are thinking about what, you know, you want to do, or if you have a position that you have in Washington, D.C., and then life may take you to Seattle or, to, or you're in one country and you may need to go to another country. Uh, you know, the first thing that you do is, is look out to see what kind of alumni connections there are there. Uh, and so I, I could go on really about this on and on, but I, I'll stop there. And, um, and if Asmat wants to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, I would echo, you know, all of the things you said. Um, I. I meet so many journal, like working journalists today who have some incredible skills, but this, the solid foundation that would allow them, for example, to like build their own database and actually do even better work than the work they're, they're doing. Like they oftentimes don't have it. I'm like, oh, I just wish that they knew X, this like foundational thing. They could scale their work dramatically. And like, that's not something you learn necessarily in the workplace. Sometimes you can, if you get really lucky, but it's something that you can, definitely learn in a journalism school in a structural way. There's a lot of technical skills. And I think a lot about like filmmaking and, you know, that path, but there, are, you know, a large part of this is that very solid foundation that you cannot gain elsewhere. But to echo Jelani about community, um, I just want to like rewind. I, I was at Frontline at the time. I was like a young, um, I think my first position there was as a researcher. And um, I met a young graduate of Columbia Journalism School and her colleague from the journalism school. So Habiba Nosheen and Hilka Shaman, whom I had, were graduates of the school at the time and they were producing a front line. Um, and I was like, wow, they're so young. Like usually the filmmakers are never this young. They're so cool. And we became friends and, you know, they, they just had such a bond. And I was like, how did this happen? And they're like, oh yeah, it's CJS. Like we were in this course together. We teamed up, this project originated out of that. And like, that's something you wouldn't get, like, really, like, think about it, like the invite, like work environments can breed friendships, but they're not the kind of friendships and like collaboration that can come out of a J school and that kind of environment where you are, you know, you really have that chance to like build things with other people to not have a lot of the same kinds of um you know how work environments are very different, right? But like as a student, you have that ability to and it made total sense to me. I was like, oh, of course you guys have left this program and are doing this thing. And I've seen it again and again out of the CJS community. I think that there are collaborations, there's community, there's that um, network. People oftentimes talk about like who you're around. And I sometimes people say kind of like in this direct, not a very kind way, they just say things like journalism school is for networks and connections. And like, 
that is a part of it. And it's an incredibly important part, like the people you meet, but I think it's deeper than that. It's like the kind of things that you build together and you're with like-minded people who are similarly trying to do that. And I think you take that kind of approach to it, that kind of like, this is not just about me. This is about like creating this journalism. It's about building this. You can make really even deeper friendships um, than you may already have and, and lifelong um, professional relationships that will serve you for, for quite a while. Excellent, thank you for, for that description, Jelani and Asma. And I'll just piggyback on, on what they just shared. Uh, usually one of the questions that we get from applicants or from prospective students who are thinking about CJS how competitive is it? How competitive is the environment? Um, what is with typical students? And I'm like, okay, we do have type A personalities because you do need that, but, and I'm not going to sugarcoat that and you're gonna hit the ground running, but the beautiful part of our student population and we see that with the faculty members is that you're not competing with one another. You're just not, you're competing with yourself you're constantly taking stock of where you are, where you're going and what you need in order to get there. So it's not rare to, and Ross, I promise I'm not gonna say they're gonna cry because Ross was like, do not tell people they're gonna cry. I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> but what I will say, that it, <laughs> it is an intense program as Jelani mentioned, it's, you, you're learning the equivalent of seven years in, in, in less than a year. So of course it is intense. Of course you're going to be pushed out of your comfort zone, but you have this wonderful community. One of our graduates had said, I felt like I was rocky and I had all of these coaches with me and <laughs> the students and my population. And that's just it. It's not rare for you, for students to walk in at nine o'clock in the morning and it's three o'clock in the morning and they're still in the building and they're working on their stories. and. What's great about it is that I can be great with videos. I can shoot, oh yes, and behind that, the lighting. But then maybe you're excellent at editing the work and saying, you know what, that's not the word that you should use. You really wanna use that. Let's clear that up. So you work together so that you're creating the best piece of work that you can put forth. And that'll carry you through, not only through the program, but throughout your career, which is lifelong. So just keep that in mind because I know that sometimes it's a little intimidating to say CJS, competitive type A personalities. Yes, but it is the community that you're walking into. It's can, I, can I say one thing? Can I say one thing? My summary, my, the way I summarize that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. About Columbia, uh, and so the journalism school. Uh, when I got in, there are really accomplished people here, um, but the good thing about it is that. Every room I, I have gone into since I've been here, I've been here for six years, every room I've walked into has had more talent than ego. And so um, you really don't want to go into the rooms that have the opposite. <laughs> With their, you know, those are not the places you, you want to be, but there are really talented people um, who are you know, aware of their level of talent and that is not the thing that they lead with. Um, and that's one thing that I think, you know, sets this uh, community apart, you know, especially given that journalism and, you know, lots of places, you know, law and medical schools, you know, very competitive, you know, journalism is, you know, a competitive space and, uh, you know, lots of demands and everything. It becomes that much easier to actually operate in that arena once we've gotten the kind of personality stuff out of the way. And we realize that we're all here uh, for the purpose of, uh, you know, educating the next generation of journalists, as uh, as our mandate from Joseph Pulitzer, you know, says. Yeah, and I just want to like point out two structural things, um, you know, that are specific to Columbia that also help this dynamic a lot. I'm, I've taught at other journalism schools, and one big distinction is that Columbia's grading system is pass fail. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes a huge difference. It really does. It is, it's about the learning. Are you learning? And um, I've noticed that that dramatically helps. So when I compare it with other teaching experiences I've had, um, I will also say that like, um, I've seen those who are the most collaborative, who are the most willing to, um, you know, put that 
before ego are the ones who tend to rise to the top. Um, and so it's kind of, and I think people know it too. Like it also is incentivizing in that direction. And so just as an example, like when I can, I try to work in students from some of my classes into, you know, where there might be needs to hire people for whether it's research or whether it's, you know, database or, um, you know, documents, whatever it might be. And so I've been able to do that. And over time, like some of them have kind of come together and they are just like, it's the, it's the most wonderful feeling. Like they collaborate well, and that's part of why I chose them too, right? They have that kind of attitude. And I think that, um, you know, just to give a shout out to them, you know, some recent graduates, Lila Hassan, Jeff Parrott, and Hiba Yazbek, like these are students um, who really reflect that ethos. And I think it's something I've seen time and time here at Columbia. It's partly, um, you know, I think it's why I choose to work with our students, um, you know, as, as much as I can. Very well said. Now, I see that we're, I, I mean, this has been wonderful. I can go on and on and on, but I know I promised all of you that it was going to be under an hour. Um, so in closing, I am going to say, we sold it, it's great. They wanna to come to the J school, it's the place to be. How do they know, meaning in whatever part of their careers that they are, how do they know that this is the right time to come to CJS? Whether it's a career changer, someone that has no experience in journalism, um, or somebody that has one or two years, how do they know like this is, mm -hmm. this is it? What should they be asking themselves or thinking about? So one of the great things about this institution is that it has evolved and it has scaled to meet different needs um, and different uh, people who are in different places. And so you know, we have an MS program and you know, that is for people who are just starting out. And if you are trying to get the fundamentals of reporting, of writing, of ethics, of the kind of foundational uh, knowledge that Asmat was just talking about, you know, that program is meant to cater to you. Uh, we have an MA program, which is for people who have uh, a bit more experience in the field and want to take their work to the next level. Uh, and, you know, there are four concentrations uh, in the MA, uh, there's business, there's science, there's arts, and there's politics. Uh, and so if you want to really, and, and the, the beautiful thing about that is that those program, programs also get to access uh, the broader set of course offerings at Columbia University. Uh, and so if you are looking to really uh, kind of deepen your skills uh, as a journalist, you know, that's a program for you. Uh, we have a dual degree uh, program here with computational uh, science. There's a data uh, journalism program, um, which is really fascinating. And, you know, really, uh, it's a little bit longer uh, than, you know, so it's a calendar year as opposed to an academic year, but really fascinating work um, that's done there. And so uh, if you are in communication, you know, with admissions, uh, and in communications with, you know, the, the folk here at Columbia, uh, we can help guide you to the program that works best for, you know, what your needs are. Yeah, I, it's hard to say for me because there's so many, like I, I was just as I was thinking about that question, I was like, oh, there's so many different kinds of people who come here. And I do, a, I do like one-on-ones with every student in my classes early on in the semester where I like asked them like a lot of questions about like, how did you get to journalism? Like what brought you here? And it, there's so many, they're, they come from such different places and experiences. And I asked them like, what's your goal? What do you want to get out of the J school this year? And like, people tell me all sorts of different things. Like I want technical expertise. A lot of people tell me like, I've been working in journalism, but I haven't been able to crack through on this next level. I'm coming to do that. Um, and I think that they, you know, I asked them like towards the end of the semester, like, how's that going? You know, I created, <laughs> I create a database of them with these things. Like I take notes as we're talking. And then towards the end of the um, semester, like I kind of asked them like, how's this going? How's that one thing you mentioned? And it's really incredible to see 
the ways in which they've kind of transformed even in just a semester or have been able to do a lot of the things that they set out or had set as goals for themselves. And like one thing I hear them, I think it's kind of consistent um, as in probably the, the thing that's most applicable to everybody is just people often say that they're walking out with the, the journalism community, that kind of connection, that cohort, people they've collaborated with, projects that they're either going to do together or these sort of lifelong friendships. But there's there's so much. They have all different kinds of things. But I would say that's the most consistent, consistent one is that people were ready for that kind of like deeper community, that kind of feeling like this is theirs, like they are part of this industry. And I think it does it um, for a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Asma. Thank you, Jelani, for your time, for sharing your experiences. Um, this has been truly illuminating. And I will leave everyone with homework now. Yes, we are not students, but I'm going to leave you with homework. Your homework is the following. Ask yourself, what am I doing now? What I would like to do in the future? And what am I missing to get there? So three questions, they seem very simple, but they will help guide you into making a decision as to whether this is the time and if we are the place, which I think we are, to get you to where you need to be. So homework, now you have homework. Where you are right now, what are you doing? Where do you see yourself going? Where do, what would you like to do? And what are the gaps that you need to fill in? to get there. So that's my homework for you. Um, and again, thank you so much. Uh, really happy to see your names, your faces. Uh, I know this will not be the last time that you see any of us or that we will be seeing you. Reach out to us, we're here. And hopefully I'll see you here as students and as graduates of the journalism school. So thank you. Thank you, Asma. Thank you, Jelani, again. Thank you. Thanks all. It was wonderful to, to see you. Mm -hmm.